Um, hi there. Uh, yeah, I know I don't need it, but you know, it's the, it's the people, the people on YouTube do. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Dan, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm a, a member of the church here at New River. Um, yeah, this morning, um, we're going to look at that passage. And I'm going to come back to that passage. But before um, we come back to that passage, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. We're going to have a little bit of a diversion. Um, some might call it a little bit of a, a party political broadcast. And um, Robin's done a, a video for us. So um, we're going to get the video up first and, and, and just watch the video. And then we'll, we'll come back to that. Thanks, guys, on the lights. We got the video? Hi there, my name's Robin Plummer and I'm a pastor of a church here in Islington. I've lived and I've served in uh, my community here in London for almost 20 years. And I absolutely love London as a city. I love the vibrancy, the mix of cultures. I like the sport, its cultural heritage, the history of the place, the sense of the world being right here on our doorstep. But I do also, if I'm honest, I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated because I see so much potential unrealised. I'm frustrated that many of our institutions are broken and I'm frustrated that politicians, those who should be serving alongside us, they're remote, they're disconnected, they're out of touch. On May the 2nd, um, we have an opportunity to vote for who we want as Mayor of London. And as Christians, uh, living and serving in this city, it's our responsibility to think about this seriously and to use our votes to, to really make a difference. I've known Dan for over 15 years. Um, I know that he shares this heart for the city that I have and which I know that you too, many of you share that too. He's got skills and gifts that I believe would be effective in bringing about real change. He's honest, he's clear in his opinions, and he has a vision for what our city could be. It's a vision which is ambitious. It's a vision which uh, ha is not encumbered by um, past failures. A vision of London as a global leader, innovating, in environmental protection, in technology, in culture and art, but with local communities embedded right at its heart. So I simply want to say on May the 2nd, if you see Dan's name on the polling card, I would wholeheartedly encourage you to put your cross against his name. Vote Dan. Right, you, you've got it here. It's my mayoral uh, campaign. It's starting. Vote Dan! Come on! Um, and, and, um, uh, hopefully Robin's endorsement has uh, convinced you, but um, if you want a little bit more... Uh, well, this is going to work today. There we go. We've had Robin's video. So, other stuff. I, I've done stuff. I've done stuff. There's reasons to vote for me. Look, here's... The, the, I, I, I'm a hydrologist. That's what I do. The water. This is the flow. It's our journal. We... Let's zoom in. Look, Dan saves the water industry. I've done stuff. Look at this. Yeah, don't don't, don't be the author. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I've done stuff. You know, I've got a track record in saving things and redeeming things. What else? What else? He'll make it better. Yeah, not only have I done stuff in the past, but I'll also make it better in the future. Um, let's see what I've done in the past. Is it going to work? Come on. There we go. Yeah, budget for office responsibility, government organisation, very respectable. The review of London mayoral commitments. Look, this is this is this is real household disposal for income. Dan Watson policy commitments. Yeah, I'll make you richer. Yeah, you vote for me, I will make you richer. Well, let's have a look. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same thing, thing. Well-being and happiness. Not only will I make you rich, I will make you happier. Look, this is what other politicians do. But look, look, I will make you happier as well. So, you know, vote Dan. Look, I've got some other political endorsements as well. Both Margaret Thatcher and Jeremy Corbyn want me to be mayor. Um, well, I didn't have a photo of me actually with Jeremy Corbyn playing football. Um, but anyway, so you go. Endorsed by Robin. I've done stuff and I'll make it better. There we go. So thank you. Thank you for indulging me. 
Um, right. Um, I did promise we'd go back um, and look at the Bible. Um, we're journeying alongside. Um, where's my notes? I need my notes for this bit. I, I memorised that bit because was excited that was fun. <laughs> and there is a point to it, honestly. It will will tie in later on. <laughs> um, so the series we're looking at about journeying alongside. It's about um, how we on our Christian journey, we're walking alongside with God beside us. But not only that, it's we're walking alongside with others and we're walking alongside with people in our lives, in our community who don't yet know Jesus. And so that's what we're looking at. And in the passage today, um, we need to remember that it, it, it's come in contact. So we're reading through John's Gospel and we've been looking sequentially at different passages um, we've had some interesting sermons and some really great stuff has been said. Um, but this passage follows on from those other sermons. Um, and we can't really understand what it is unless we reflect back on the kind of the, 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 um, the sequence. It's going to work. Come on, it will work. There we go. So this kind of whole passage starts off with Jesus doing a miracle. He heals somebody. Um, a paralyzed man, and um, Jane preached on this passage about, you know, uh, yeah, the way Jesus can transform. Um, and the thing about that miracle that that um, means it kind of cascades into all this other bit was that it occurred on the Sabbath. So Jesus was doing this, um, and there was this kind of confrontation that came after it um, with with the Pharisees. Um, because they didn't think he should be doing any work on the Sabbath. The Sabbath for the day, they're supposed to rest. They're not supposed to do things. And here's Jesus. Who is he um, healing people on the Sabbath? Um, and Jesus is responsible. Well, I'm doing my Father's work. You know, God is active, and I am loving, and I am caring, and I am involved in people's lives, and that's the right thing to do. But within that, he made this very specific statement about I'm doing my Father's work work he equated God as his father his personal father not just our father not a generic statement but it was a very personal relationship and in that context that was something very very um, profound and it basically was equating himself with God the father he was saying he was the messiah he was the king that they were waiting for now you can imagine. Well, I don't know whether you can imagine. Um, if I, I told you that I'm going to be mayor, well, I want to be mayor anyway. Maybe I'm not going to be mayor. Um, but if I told you that I was equal with God, you might look a bit aghast at me. And the Pharisees were very specific and very rigorous. And they were utterly outraged. This was blasphemy. Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. Now if that wasn't true, he deserved to die. It was a bold statement. It was something that was completely out there. And we, with our kind of Christian lens, can kind of think, oh well, yeah, Jesus was equal with God. We know he's part of the Trinity. But they hadn't come to that acceptance yet. So Jesus was putting this massive claim out there. Um, and when you make massive claims, you know, it's up to you to back them up. You know, you've got to put some proof forward. And Jesus is aware of this. He's aware of what he's doing. He's not naive. And Jesus comes and tries to meet the Pharisees where they're at. And in that context... It's not enough to just provide one proof. They needed to have three proofs. You know, and the, the same. If we make a bold claim, just having one piece of evidence to back it up isn't always enough. So Jesus presented three different proofs or testimonies to back up his statement. The first is the testimony of John the Baptist. And we can see this in the passage. Um, here we go. So... There is another who testifies in my favour. So Jesus has just made this statement um, equating himself with God the Father. 
Um, and he said, if I test my other stuff, my testimony is not true. So you say, okay, I accept that. You can't just take this because of what I've just said. But there is bigger stuff going on here. It's not just me. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. So where we have, we have another person who's ministering at the same time. Somebody who um, has caused a stir. Somebody who people are following. Somebody who is making a difference. Somebody that the Pharisees um, are a bit uncomfortable with, not sure how to deal with. But they haven't shut down John's ministry. They're not saying that John's ministry is unholy and wrong. They haven't decried him. And he was saying, well, you don't tell John to, to go away and be quiet. Well, John, he's pointing towards me. Now, if you're accepting John's words that people should repent, and John is saying that about me, you can't accept both sides of the coin. So John's words were a testimony to Jesus. Um, the second one is the testimony of Jesus' ministry. So what Jesus was active and doing. Um, now I suppose maybe this is the, the one that's possibly easiest for us to recognize. So how do we know Jesus was God? Well, Jesus was doing amazing things. We have them written down in the scripture. And the Pharisees won't have been unaware of this. It, this story starts with a healing. Jesus doing something amazing. He was doing something that is miraculous. You know, humanly speaking, what he is doing is not possible. It is only possible through the power of God. So we have another testimony. And it says uh, as well, it's, um, and the Father who sent me has testified concerning me. You know, that's the testimony in terms of blessing Jesus with this power. But also we have um, the story just a couple of chapters ago about Jesus being baptized and that voice coming down from heaven. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So we have the what has been going on active, what people have been seeing around them. You might not accept me saying that I'm equal with God the Father, says Jesus. But how do you explain what you can see? How can you explain what you have heard? How can you explain the reports if that's not true? And then the final proof he puts forward is the, the testimony of Scripture. You know, what has been written in the Jewish Scriptures in our Old Testament? He says to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testimony testify about me. The Pharisees, um, we give the Pharisees a very bad name. You know, if we call someone Pharisaical. Um, it's, it's not a good, good thing to call someone. But the Pharisees, okay, there were some lot of good things about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were dedicated to God. They were dedicated to scripture. They knew God's word. They knew what had been written. They knew the prophecies. They knew the words where the, the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. They knew the things that were happening, how the prisoners were going to be set free, the, the blind were going to be able to see, the lame were going to be healed. They could see how time and time again the things that Jesus were doing were in accord with that prophecy, with that what has been written hundreds of years before. And so those scriptures were directly pointing back to Jesus saying, yes, this is the Messiah. This is the one that was promised. His claim, his bold claim, his ridiculous claim, he's got some validity. gone too far. Didn't want to that one yet. Nah, it's going on. How do I go back? Can you make it go back for me? There you go. Um, 
the interesting thing I, I found in, in, in this is in my head, when you think about these three different testimonies, you've got what's written in the Bible, we've got the miracles of Jesus, and we've got what John the Baptist said. In my head, and I think Jesus acknowledges this, it's the, the miracles and what's written in Scripture that kind of stand out. They're the things. Well, obviously, you know, if we were going to pick things today about why Jesus was the Son of God, those are the things maybe we would go to. But Jesus is very clear that for his audience, <laughs> they, they don't work. It's like, yet you refuse to come to me. So you study the Scriptures. You, you, you can see the parallels between my life and what's been prophesied. And yet that's not enough for you. And the, the miracles, the things that are going on, the, the power of God that's being displayed. For you do not yet believe the one he sent. You've seen them, but you can't accept them. But if we go back to the first testimony, there's no mention that that is ineffective. And Jesus says, this is actually a weaker testimony. But I'm putting it there because I know this is something that will have weight with you. That will actually have traction. And I want you to understand. I want you to believe. I want you to be saved. So Jesus puts three proofs. One weak proof and two cast iron proofs. But he includes the weak proof because he knows that's actually what somebody is going to listen to. And Jesus will do anything to save the lost. To save that lost sheep. And so, I found it quite interesting. What is effectively so powerful in a weak proof? And it all comes down to the person of John. If you think back to my political campaign, so it does circle back. Uh, there is a reason why I did it. <laughs> honestly, honestly. Uh, I wasn't just having fun. Um, I gave you three proofs as well. I gave you a, a personal commendation from Robin. I gave you a report of all the things that I've been doing. The wonderful, amazing way I've saved the water industry. And I gave you some predictions from the the Office of Budgetary Responsibility about how my policies were going to be better than everyone else's. Now, I'll throw it open to you. Admittedly, there was a little bit of photoshopping that went on in there. A little bit! Okay. Um, which one of those held the... M ignoring the photoshopping, which one of those actually held the most weight for you? Yeah, yeah, it's the person, wasn't it? It's e evidently, you know. Most of you know Robin. Most of you have had experience of him. And also, he's the pastor of our church. Exactly. There's something powerful about words that are spoken by someone we know and trust. And Robin, God, we thank you for Robin. He's amazing and we love him. Yeah, God has blessed us with Robin. Got, Robin is someone with integrity. Yeah, well, let's embarrass him. Let's make him blush. <laughs> Give us a round of applause for Robin. Woo! <laughs> okay. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that we walk alongside and we come into contact with non-Christians. Um, or maybe people who have just tentatively made a commitment but are seeking to understand more. Or maybe just people who are less mature in their faith. They will weigh up the value of our words and of our beliefs 
not just by the value of those words themselves, but by some slightly vague and intangible notion of integrity, about how much they trust us. It's important. People outside the church are sceptical about Jesus' miracles. They're not sure if they can trust that. A lot of people, most people outside the church, aren't particularly interested in the Bible. They don't know what the Bible says. They're not going to see how the Bible points towards Jesus as the personal saviour who loves them and wants to know them. But even so, those people, they can be attracted to Jesus through what they see you doing, from what they hear you saying. But to a degree, the weight they apply to those what they see and what they hear will depend on how much trust they have from you, their perception of your integrity. Robin's endorsement of my political career has more weight because of his integrity, of how much he has earned our trust. Maybe he's eroded it now by that endorsement. <laughs> You've lost all respect now, John. Sorry, Robin. Um, You've managed to lose your integrity during a preach on the subject of integrity. <laughs> John's words about Jesus being the Messiah had more weight to the Pharisees because they recognised his integrity. The people surrounding the crowds trusted John. So what is integrity? Um, let's just reflect on John. What do we know about John? So who knows anything about John? Any, any hands up of... Uh, what do you know about John the Baptist? Yeah, yeah. That's Oh, right, okay. Okay, that's interesting. Has anyone got else got a picture of what they think John the Baptist might have looked like? Not a rhetorical question. I do expect responses. Robin? He looked like a prophet. So, what was a prophet? Bald on top? Oh, well, outfit. So, it does say in the Bible he wore camel skin. Yeah, that's it. Itchy, horrible clothes. What did you say? Oh, somebody behind. Unkempt, unkempt. Yeah, yeah. And what, what, what did he get up to? What was, it, what was his, you know, what do we no see him doing in the Bible? Anyone? Uh, honey and locusts. Locust. Yes, that's right. He was out in the wilderness. <laughs> and what was he doing out in the wilderness, do we think? Does anyone know anything about what he was doing? Baptizing? Yeah, he was, he was preaching, preaching to the crowds. Um, and we also got stories about his confrontation with Herod. You know, and he was ultimately beheaded for challenging the, the political leaders and their morality, immorality rather. I'm getting the right way around. Um, so we've got this picture of John. And some of the things in there you can maybe start to see why people might trust a person like that. And I was thinking about this, the very particular things that we can see in the Bible about John that we can take as parallels and lessons that we could apply to our life. And, you know, as it's a sermon, I came up with three things. Um, so, yeah, what does John's ministry teach us about integrity or earning trust? Um, number one, oh, it's gone too far. Clear, you know the second one is, there we go. Clear and consistent. Um, so, John's primary message was about repentance, as Robin um, pointed out. He's basically telling people that they were sinners. Um, they got it wrong. They need to change direction, turn back to God. It's not an easy message. It's not a lot of fun if that's your, what God's called you to do. You see a few prophets in the Old Testament who are, who are called to basically tell Israel or Judah that they've got things wrong and their lives never seem to go particularly happily from a human perspective. It's not an easy ministry. But it's something that John does consistently and faithfully over the years of his ministry. He doesn't shy away from a difficult task. That's a sign of integrity. 
He was also a thorn in the Herod's side, calling out immorality at personal risk and danger to himself. That's integrity. If we, I'm not saying we necessarily have to go around condemning people's sins or putting ourselves in danger. We may be called into that situation. God does call people to do that. That's not for everyone. But in terms of each of our lives, I believe that there is a call to be clear and consistent in what God has called us to. To not vacillate, not change direction based on the company we're in or our mood. We should never shy away from what we believe. Humble. I've written here, John was not a shrinking violet. And Ruth was reading through my notes. She said, what's a shrinking violet anyway? I know what you mean, but I don't... Does anyone know what actually a shrinking violet was? No? But he wasn't a shrinking violet. John wasn't a shrinking violet. Um, he didn't shy away from the public stage. You know, he was a preacher. He was out there um, talking to people. He didn't shy away from confrontation. You know, he was prepared to um, go up against the political powers. Doesn't potentially conform to some people's view of what being humble or humility is. It is, however, crystal clear from the Gospel that John was not seeking the limelight for himself. He didn't want his own glory. When Jesus appeared on the scene, John immediately turned to his disciples and said, this is the guy you should be following, not me. John was a person who was faithful to his task, but not for his own benefit. He was giving the glory where it was due. I think humility, we don't necessarily know enough about John to kind of uh, talk more generally about humility from the, the life of John, but humility goes beyond that, and I think it's an important attribute that within integrity. It's about celebrating other people's successes. It's about thinking about other people's needs before our own maybe, or definitely before our own, allowing other people time to speak, asking other people questions that show you're interested in them as individuals, and you're genuinely listening. More about others and their needs and less about our own. That is a sign of integrity. The final thing I just wanted to pull out about John's ministry that I think is important from thinking about this is that John was known. Um, by this I mean that y it's very hard to trust someone you don't know. <laughs> um, but I think there's a phrase somewhere in, in the Gospels that, uh, that that John's ministry was in the wilderness. And it's quite easy to think about this was John was a bit of a hermit. He had gone out into the middle of nowhere that no one could find him. And, you know, he was trying to avoid human contact. But when you read through more widely, I don't really get that impression. Um, I think the wilderness is saying he wasn't in the city. He was in the bit between Jerusalem and Galilee. And there was a kind of bit where maybe slightly fewer people lived, but it was the main thoroughfare and it was well trafficked and there were crowds there and he had disciples and he was engaged in the discussion that was happening around the, the country and the political environment. You know, John put himself on a public stage. He made himself known and you can't be trusted unless you are known. And living in that kind of environment, you're, you, you can't hide away. I don't think there's any suggestion that, you know, John, you know, did his daily haranguing, calling people to repentance in his camel skin clothes and then went home 
took off the camel fin, put his silk on and put his feet up in luxury. You get this sense of this kind of devoted lifestyle that people could see because he was known in that public eye. There was a genuineness there. For us to build trust, we also need to be known. That's not to say you need to be in the public eye. You know, we don't all necessarily want to put ourselves on a stage. But for those who we are journeying alongside, those we walk with, we can only earn their trust if we are known by them. We need to invest time in relationships, in individuals, in people. Um, and it, it's time is really important. Time is, you know, a massive thing. But it's it's also about the quality of time and what you do with that time. You know, part of that I've said in the previous point that you know we should listen, we should ask questions. We also need to share as well. You know, sharing is also an important thing. You know, you've got to allow yourself to be known. People need to be able to break through that skin. It's very easy to put up a a barrier and pr to protect ourselves. You need to allow people inside that barrier if you want to earn trust. Being known doesn't mean we have integrity, um, but it's an important piece of the jigsaw because it's only through being known that we can earn that trust. People can see an integrity that comes out of our faith so that God's light can shine into situations. Let's just close in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the Messiah and the whole of creation and history and scripture point towards him. And we know that for ourselves. But Lord, we pray too that our lives our daily lives, walking alongside others, would be a testimony to Jesus too, and that people would see that light of Jesus through our actions, through the way we share your love. Give us courage to stand up for right in difficult situations. And help us, Lord, to invest, invest in others, to care about those we're journeying alongside, Lord. In your name we pray.